Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie, and this is The Reason Podcast. Please subscribe to us at iTunes and rate and review us while you're there. Today, I'm pleased to introduce one of the two greatest libertarians in this conversation, the best-selling author P.J. O'Rourke, whose latest book, How the Hell Did This Happen?, chronicles the most insane year ever in American politics. P.J., thanks for talking to us. Oh, you're very welcome. Okay, and I uh, rush to add that I'm actually calling you from a place that you used to call home back in the day, Oxford, Ohio, home to Miami University, your alma mater. Uh, what, yes, do you remember, what do you remember most about Miami University? Uh, the, I, 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 it's all the stuff that I can't remember that really is from. <laughs> that makes you think of it fondly, right? Yes, yeah. There, there are some, some, some very pleasant blurry patches back you, there. But what did you was, major uh, in? At, at English, English. Yeah. English. I was looking through the course syllabus when we didn't in those days. Didn't you didn't have to decide till like the end of your sophomore year or something what your major was? And I'm looking through the course syllabus and I, and I came across English and I went. I speak that. <laughs> <laughs> How hard can it be? Do you? Uh, I mean, you have kids, uh, college age kids, post college age kids. Do you? I've got a college age kid okay, and two a, that are younger. Okay, but do you? Will you insist that they go to college and learn how to become an engineer or something useful, or do you actually find something meaningful in? looking at the humanities or the social sciences or something like that. No, that's what I insist on them them, you know, I mean even uh my my eldest daughter is somewhat business minded now. I'm trying to keep her out of business school. I said, <laughs> you know, honey, there's time for that if you want to get your MBA later. It really doesn't matter what your prior what your undergraduate is. You, this is the chance to really immerse yourself. Uh well, be immersed. Uh in um uh, uh in the history of civilization you know in 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 literature in the arts um you're going to be forced march through these things some of it's going to be boring um some of it you won't appreciate for another 40 years uh but it's the the, the la that college liberal arts education is the last chance you really get to to um i mean you can teach yourself but <clears throat> I found with a lot of things that I've taught myself that uh, uh, I needed a better professor. Yes. <laughs> that <laughs> explains why when I turn the lights on in half of my house, uh, something pops and everything goes dark. Uh, yeah. Yes, and it explains my carpentry, which my <laughs> wife has exiled to, you know, the, the garage shelf um, department and I'm occasionally allowed to do something inside a closet. Watch out! You know that's uh, those were David Carradine's last words, I think, who was uh, found dead right. in a uh, in a Thai uh, hotel room closet, I believe, uh, just a few <laughs> years ago. I had forgotten about that. Uh, no, no, many no. of us have <laughs> not, tried. Not Some of us have <laughs> succeeded. Obviously. Yeah. Well, here, let me ask you before we start talking about the large themes about how how the hell did this happen? And it's fantastic to have you as our kind of Virgil. Through what I really do hope is the worst year ever, because, you know, we've got there's still a future ahead of us where things could always get worse. But do you consider yourself more of a libertarian or a conservative? Um, and where, where do you see the borderline between those kind of concepts or ideologies overlapping? Where's the where's the no man's land for you? Oh, well, it, 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 it really depends upon um, from what angle we're looking at things politically. I consider myself primarily to be a libertarian. I am personally conservative. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm conservative about religion. I'm conservative about moral values. Um, I, I'm probably even somewhat conservative, and um, I'm more conservative than many libertarians are in, 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 in foreign policy. But when it comes to the rule of law, and the construct of politics, um, and the way that the, 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 the politics and the individual, um, I always think of libertarianism as basically being an analytical tool, not an ideology per se, but an analytical tool. So when you look at something that happens, especially in politics, when you look at something that happens, you say, does this increase the dignity of the individual? Does this increase the liberty of the individual? Does this increase the responsibility of the individual? And if it meets those three criteria, then it's probably an acceptable libertarian political policy. 
or lack thereof, because, you know, we, we, we like to subtract some things from politics, too. Well, you wrote uh, on these themes, you wrote an absolutely amazing piece for the Weekly Standard, which appears or is, is pulled out of the book, How the Hell Did This Happen?, uh, which is on sale at Amazon, bookstores everywhere. Um, and uh, But uh, an amazing piece for the Weekly Standard uh, called The Revolt Ag- Against the Elites and the Limits of Populism. Thank and you. you know that even in well-behaved countries, you know, rel- relatively speaking, such as Australia and France and whatnot, populism is rising and people are sick of being treated as cogs in some kind of Davos devotee or attendees, banker, or money-making machine. What is good about the new populism for you and what scares you about it? Well, uh, let's talk about the good because it's more first because it's more limited. Um, the the, the, the it, it's definitely true that the the I think there's a worldwide animus going on uh, against the elites, and um, part of this is because of the shift in the in 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 in, in, the, in the economy. Um, the shift toward a toward a much more high tech economy is leaving a lot of people with, with who have manual skills and um, or, or or simply the capacity for hard labor is leaving them way behind. And you know this is something that uh, that people th- th- needs to be addressed, needs to be recognized because it can it's not so much actually that that the divide between the rich and poor has gotten greater there's actually been tremendous strides uh around the world uh, at abolishing the worst level of poverty we we've had the numbers come people who are living on a buck or a buck 50 a day and the, the number of those people has come down very considerably um but they they're feeling a sort of uh, of ceiling, uh, an aspirational ceiling. Uh, the, the fact that a lot of it has to do with lack of rule of law in, in places, not only in utterly chaotic places like, say, Somalia or Sudan, um, but in in, in in very corrupt places like Russia and China, is making people very angry. And I think that's really something. I mean, you know, rule of law is is, is is something that's fundamental to a free society. Def- define rule of law. Do you mean that you know that the rules apply to everybody? Same rules. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you can actually you can sort of extrapolate from this um, that um, uh, it doesn't even it doesn't have to be perfect law. That as long as the rules of a society apply to 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 everybody, um, there there is a kind of justice in the air. But when there is an exception because of wealth or power or holiness or fame, um, uh, you name you, uh, you know, if if there is a mechanism by which somebody can step outside the Justice Department, then then that law is lousy, no matter how liberally written, no matter how carefully, you know, no matter how uh, uh, merciful it is or how just it is. If people can avoid it, that law is bad. So that, for instance, when 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 China first moved into um, uh, uh, in in into a free market sort of situation, uh, and, and before the level of corruption uh, had, had risen so high, there was a period where you could look at China and say, well, at least they have rule of law. It's not very good rule of law, as Tiananmen Square clear, right. clearly pointed out. It's not a place you choose to live or a system that you would you would design in your mind as as being ideal, but that law does seem to apply um, uh, uh, to everybody from Jiang down. You know, uh, but that went away pretty quickly. Well, what about in uh, you know you you talk about uh, countries like France, uh, Hungary is one, Russia is certainly one, the United States, England. These are also places that are experiencing real uh, paroxysms of populism, and I'm sorry to be alliterative there. Um, you know, and is it say in America? Um, you know, is it? It's not the su- it's not the super poor people. It seems to be the the people who feel left behind. This is the people that Hillary ignored, Hillary Clinton ignored, and Donald Trump spoke to directly and said, "I'm going to help you." Um, so yes, is, it, yeah. is the populism it, it, partly a function of advanced economies and people being? Uh, Peel no, off. actually, I would say, mo- mo- well, a couple things going on. Uh, one thing sets us apart from Europe. 
Europe is is suffering from a, uh, a, a, a tremendous refugee crisis that the governmental elites of Europe have completely failed to address. They've failed to address its cause. They've failed to address its effects. They've failed to address its after effects. Uh, they've failed to address its intentional and its unintentional effects. They just have just completely screwed things up. And, and I think that probably holds the key to the Brexit vote was uh, uh, NPR, uh, which was, you know, NPR-ish, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, they do a good job. And they did an uh, uh, afterward sort of, you know, uh, exit poll where they went around to places that had voted heavily uh, for Brexit. And the response was, uh, was, was, was pretty much across the board. It, it wasn't racist. It wasn't violent. It wasn't xenophobic. But it was, this isn't the Britain that I grew up in. You know, things are changing. They're changing. There's obviously a fear of what was going on in Germany, what was going on in France, a fear of that taking hold in Britain that, you know, made people want to separate themselves. Here, I think it's more directly uh, an effect of, of, of expansion of government to the point where government has just has its thumb in every conceivable pie. I mean, it's just we are so complexly regulated uh, that it's driving people crazy. And the people that is driving crazy are the core Trump voters. Um, they, they tend to be um, uh, uh, small business people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, uh, skilled, often highly skilled, uh, uh, blue collar. I mean, you know, they're, they're, their incomes wouldn't indicate that they're blue collar and their education might not. But these but are the, like craftsmen or... Uh, but they are. Yeah, they're plumbers skilled, and electricians. Skilled, they may be master uh, electricians, yeah. maybe master plumbers, but, you know, they may own a little bit. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people who are at Trump rallies and um, I found like I could kid with them, you know, I mean, you know, I says, Trump was not my choice. And I, you know, I was, I, I, but I was, I was talking to a guy and he said, damn it, I own a gas station and a uh, towing operation. And uh, he says, just me and my wife, I don't have like a, a, a I, I don't have a, a human services department. I don't have a, 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 you know, legal department. He said, every time some jerk in Washington passes some new idea, he does, never seems to think that it means another pile of paperwork on my desk. Right. And uh, not and he's to paperwork's the, uh, not, does he have to give his wife paid maternity leave now? Uh, probably, the, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, and he said, that, you know, I've got old gas tanks at my gas station, and I, need, I can't get the local, state, and federal permits to get them removed. I can't re get the local, state, and federal permits to, to install new ones. He said, this, you know, this is just, you know, I'm regulated from every conceivable direction. He said, I can afford, he had a fair number of employees, and he said, I can afford the Obamacare. He said, but what I can't afford is the paperwork that comes with it. That's not what I do. Uh, and, you know, and he said, you know, he kept repeating, it's just me and my wife. And um, so I really liked the guy, and we got to talking about some other stuff and so on. And so I had, finally I said to him, so electing a maniac fixes this how? And he, he, he laughed. <laughs> he said, I don't know, but, you know, the, 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 the hell with a bunch of them, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I'm voting for Trump. You and you scandalously, uh, at least in uh, certainly the reason offices, you scandalously endorsed Hillary or you said you wouldn't vote for Trump because of. No, uh, I, and I did vote for Hillary. And you did vote for How, how did that feel? Uh, OK, well, it was a matter of, if I may say so, reason. <laughs> uh, it was. I looked at this, you know, the, in the commodity market, there's something called the, the VIX, the volatility index. You can actually buy uh, uh, pr predictions of how volatile the markets will be. And they call it the fear index. You can actually buy and sell <laughs> fear on the commodity index. And uh, uh, I looked at the, the, the volatility of the two candidates, and I thought, I know with probably about 98, 99% assurance exactly what I'm getting with Hillary. I loathe and detest it, but we just survived eight years of it. I doubt it will last more than four more. Uh, it's very rare for American political cycles to last longer than 12 years, as poor George H.W. Bush <laughs> proved. Um, and I said, you know, we survived eight years of it. 
we can survive another four. I know what's coming. I looked over at Trump and I said, I have no idea. I just have no idea. He might turn out to be an absolutely ordinary president. You know, I don't like this populist noise. I particularly hated the xenophobia. I mean, the, that, that, that was probably, if I had to put one finger on a thing about Trump was the, the scapegoating noise, the, 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 this, the stuff about refugees, the stuff about immigrants and so on. I mean, did we learn nothing from that horrible period between World War I and World War II? You know? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm pro-immigrant guy. I mean, it's, I, I will listen to anti-immigrant talk from a full-blooded American Indian and nobody else. <laughs> They've got a beef. <laughs> well, let's talk uh, specifically about Donald Trump a little bit. You've likened him to Juan Perón, the authoritarian socialist who helped transform Argentina from one of the wealthiest countries in the world, really, to a second-tier shithole. And it's never really climbed out of that. It, actually, it, I likened him to Evita. Yeah, well, I, I was going to say, if Trump is Juan Perón, does that mean Melania is Evita? And is no, she no, it's start Trump, was, uh, Trump was Evita. Oh, okay. I said, actually, we had a pair of them. I said, you know, it was, it, it, we were definitely, we were definitely going going through a period in global politics where there's kind of a, an accent on the strong person. You know? <laughs> Imagine uh, if he starts wearing a, uh, you know, a military uniform with braids on the, the, the epaulets. Well, one wouldn't the... put it past him. You know? So I mean, what the, frightens um, you? In, in, uh, yeah, I think the, it, 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 he, he could do it. What but no, I, I thought he was more of a, I, I, it is my sincere hope that we're having uh uh, history repeated as, uh, which comes first as tragedy <laughs> and then is repeated as comedy. Uh, so I'm hoping or, that this or an is Andrew the... Lloyd Webber uh, musical. Right, right. right. exactly. So, which I think I'm is hoping the we're in the song. Andrew Lloyd Webber <laughs> version of the period between World War One and World War Two. So, what frightens you most about Trump? You, I mean, because you've said also that we're not in a teachable moment uh, because we're too scared of everything. We're scared of foreigners. We're scared of the pace of technological change. The rise of addicted. People, uh, you, uh, you've you talked about how um, a lot of the people have been left behind. Uh, I think at one point you talk about how the uh, the Kenmore appliance repairman is, uh, you know, he can't he can't fix your refrigerator because uh, he's he's uh, down and out on Oxycontin or heroin. What yeah, you but most? first Sears disappeared. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, you know, this is you take the bad with the good, right? It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who dressed exclusively in tough skins. As a child, I'm uh, always happy to see at least that part of Sears go away. But what what um, I mean, you've talked about the xenophobia in Trump uh, and you obviously like the idea that he could, uh, you know, put start a nuclear war or, or a war war. But what else? I mean, is there a broader sensibility? Oh, well, this is just you? not a small government guy by personality, by whatever passes for ideology with him. I mean, this is like a big brushstroke person. And I don't have any use for that. You know, I want, I want the government to shrink in the wash. Uh, uh, you know, I want it both cleaner and smaller, please. Uh, <laughs> and wider. And, is that where you're going? Have you joined? Yeah, the, exactly. uh, well, yeah. no, it is not <laughs> where I'm going at all. As a matter of fact, um, the, uh, 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 no, as a matter of fact, if anything, I wanted to, uh, I want the nation to be more colorful. Um, I mean, I just see, I, I mean, at the core of libertarianism as an attitude and as a, as a, you know, as a way of thinking about politics is the idea that people are assets. This is all about people and that people should, are assets and, and, and should be treated as assets, not as, you know, and the liberal idea is that people are burdens, you know, more sick people means more government expense, more poor people means more government expense, more any kind of people means more government expense. Um, whereas I, I think, you know, it means more growth, more vitality. And and I guess Trump then, from this position, it's, you know, because obviously Democrats and liberals more broadly, as well as progressives, are really, you know, they're going after him with everything they've got, you know, that he's a stooge of Russia. They sure are, yeah. so that. But, but in point but of fact, he's one is, of them. Yeah, that's, uh, explore that a little bit or explain that a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, he's one of them, but he's coming at it from a sort of like a populist uh, throw down the ladder. You know, I got mine, uh, F you, you know. 
uh, uh, he, he's there's a you know a segment of America that feels threatened by change, change of all kinds, and he's saying, well, I'm going to make things like they they used to be, but the tools that he's going to use, huge infrastructure spending, you know, sort of big digs everywhere, you know. Uh, it won't be just confined to Boston. You'll get them in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, you know, the, 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 the big infantry, huge rise in military budget. I mean, we already spend more than the other top, what is it, 10 countries combined? Um, uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, our, we may have a foreign policy that doesn't make any sense, but you don't want to mess with our military. And, um, uh, you know, he's, he's a big government guy. He's a big government guy for small-minded people. Uh, and the liberals are so mad at him because they regard themselves as large-minded people. But, you know, of course, they are equally big government. It's just, what a, you know, which part of the government do you want to increase? Do you want to, you know, build an aircraft carrier or more transgender bathrooms? And right. I, I don't know. That was something else somebody said to me on, on, on the campaign trail at a Trump rally. He said talking about failure of the elites. He said, damn it. He said, I'm in the logging business. I am so regular. And again, the, the, like many people I talked to, he talked about like regulation, but at the end of it, he said, you know, and I turn on the TV at night and what's the lead news story. It's about transgender bathrooms. We don't have any bathrooms in the woods. <laughs> What, uh, what do you do with that? I mean, um, I guess, you know, you, you wrote, uh, and let me quote from uh, something you wrote. You said, a person of libertarian inclinations can understand and sympathize with the revolt against the elites. And obviously that's what you did on the campaign trail. You were talking to the people, yeah. talking back. But then you said, so far the revolt is not promoting an increase in individual dignity, individual freedom, and individual responsible. Uh, responsibility. It's doing the opposite. And and you also talk about populism as a libertarian tragedy. And I think, you know, from what you've been talking about, it makes sense. Um, but then how do you how do you answer? How did you answer the guy who was, you know, pissed about the transgender bathrooms um, to get to stuff that is actually going to change his situation uh, as well as, you know, transgender people's situation. Yeah, well, fortunately, I wasn't there campaigning for Rand Paul, or I would have had to address that. <laughs> I mean, I was just there as a reporter, so the way I responded to him was by writing what he said down. Right. Yes. <laughs> okay. well, that's... And it was, I mean, it, that was like a weird sort of like personal breakthrough moment I had with the with the uh, garage guy. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah. I, that I felt like I could like talk to him man to man, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, he just obviously uh, one of those people with obvious, evident, good sense of uh, of humor, and um, uh, you know I make him sound really grumpy, but he wasn't. He didn't have that affect actually in person. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, how in, one of the things that it takes, unfortunately, in, given the nature of our political system and our political tradition, you need somebody who is like really good at getting this stuff across the way Ronald Reagan was. And uh, I mean, it'd be nice. Uh, I would prefer uh, uh, things to be so that what I could tell you was, well, we just, we have to do more libertarian education. We have to do more libertarian outreach. We've got to get younger people more, who have libertarian inclinations more engaged in this. But in fact, it requires the kind of leadership that was not provided by Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. Talking about the, I mean, what do you mean? He he was not inspired. He just ran he a terrible not. campaign. Yeah, there were so many moments. It, it seemed to me over this campaign cycle that lasted for two years, when libertarian stuff could catch fire, and it didn't. I had some hope for Rand Paul, but. Um, Rand is unfortunately um, burdened, burdened by intellect in a way. I mean, you ask uh, uh, Rand a question, and you get the whole answer. And while that's great for an interview, it's not great on the stump. Mm -hmm. Who did you? You don't get the joke, you know, that you got from Reagan. You don't get you don't get the thing boiled down. Who who did you see? I mean, because you you were covering everybody on the campaign, and uh, surprisingly, yeah. I I think you you had the nicest. Uh, I think you were the nicest to Ben Carson, who is kind of a comedy minefield. But um, you said yeah. people like Ted Cruz, you know, that he's the type of guy who is 
you know, giving a kind of Billy Sunday sermon inside the tent while his friends are around the back uh, kissing uh, <laughs> Christian camp girls. But was there anybody on the on the hustings, whether, uh, you know, on the fringes of Hillary's campaign or in the Republican Party or anywhere who, who you thought, um, could you even stitch a character together from all of these different people? That would that would do what you what you want to do. Uh, no, I think Rand probably came closest, mm -hmm. and he's just going to have to be seasoned in oak longer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not talk you as know, much. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, in a funny sort of way, not talk as much or talk more directly. You know, um, actually, I was I was impressed by by um, by. Um, mo a number of the Republicans that I saw were pretty impressive in small town hall meeting uh, situations. That includes Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. Uh, actually, were, were, Jeb Bush was very plausibly presidential. You know, a little probably of the more more moderate wing of the Republican Party, less libertarian wing of the Republican Party than than, than me. Um, but uh, uh, and some of the most likable. I really dumped on Mike Huckabee, which I feel bad about because I like Huckabee. Um, but he, he just ran an awful sort of social conservative campaign when that was not what was on people's mind. Um, the um, I was impressed with Marco Rubio. He kind of went off the rails there, I think, because of inexperience and nervousness. Um, uh, but uh, I actually saw him at St. Anselm's College up here uh, with a fairly large group, and he not only was he did he give a good talk, but he then did a long Q&A uh, 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 session with some very grumpy voters, and he was very patient um, uh, with his explanations, and he sh seemed to show some grasp of libertarian ideas. Yeah, I've, I've seen him give speeches that had the hair on the back of my neck uh, rising up. He can He can sell it when he has to, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, but except that, that I, I don't think your phrase is exactly right. He 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 can sell it, but he can't always summon it. Yeah, you know he can't always summon that pitch. It's not reliable for him. <laughs> so he you know, needs to he needs to get uh, he needs to be doping before every game, right? So that something. He, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. What um you know in. In some of your writings, you talk about the, the pace of technological change uh, seems different over the past, say, 30 or 40 years, and that in the digital era, in the inter internet era, that change is more disruptive. Uh, and you, you've underscored you know, that uh, techn technological innovation is always disruptive, but that there was something linear to the Industrial Revolution. You see a train, then you see a car. What What's going on that's different now? I explain how... Uh, you know, kind of past technological re uh, revolutions or innovations, which really have a profound impact on the culture, on the society, on the politics, how they were different, and then why it's different now, and and how we might grapple with that more uh, more fruitfully than we have. Well, there, the 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 two examples, uh, two prior technological examples uh, that that I would use. Uh, first, there was an agricultural revolution at the at the end of the um, uh, of the in the late Middle Ages, which arguably led to the Renaissance. Uh, uh, Adam Smith makes that argument in The Wealth of Nations, um, and, and then of course the Industrial Revolution. We know how disruptive uh, dark satanic mills and all of that that the Industrial Revolution was. But the thing we have to understand about those re re revolutions was first that they were slow, especially the agricultural revolution was it was very gradual, so gradual that, that, that it wasn't until a couple hundred years later that people really could realize that it had happened. The Industrial Revolution was much faster, but it worked on very basic principles of mechanics that that your average plowman could look at this machine and see how it worked. And it was linear, uh, as you said. I mean, once you had seen a railroad, how surprised could you be about by an automobile, you know, which is just lo a locomotive off its track. You know? the, uh, so that the Industrial Revolution was comprehensible to people. It happened fairly quickly, but not nearly as quickly as the... IT revolution, or the, the 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 you know the 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 electronic revolution, or the internet revolution, whatever you want to call it, and that the 
the the the side effects of this very quick technological change have been exceedingly unpredictable. I mean, who at the onset of the internet would predict that it would make the the the, the anchor store at the local mall go away? I mean, you just, it's just it has these totally surprising effects on people's lives and their jobs, and and it spreads fear, even to people who have nothing to fear. Uh, you know, I mean, nursing care cannot be replaced by Facebook. Right. But, um, but, but travel it, agents, you know, they're like, who mourns yeah. for the travel agent, right? Yeah, exactly, except the, the out-of-work travel agent, right. you know. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody feel is feeling that this is upending their business. And even when their business, um, um, uh, I was uh, – uh, in and out being treated for for a while up at at um, uh, at, at Dartmouth at uh, at um, Mary Hitchcock up there, and uh, they had just gotten a brand new computer system at umpteen million dollars that was really working well for them, and the federal government came in and mandated that they change their computer system. They had to spend another umpteen million dollars, and of course everybody. Uh, you know, from the from the candy striper girl right to, to the heart surgeon, had to learn how to use this new system. They were pissed. You know, I mean, nobody's job was in danger, but they were irked, and they were irked. You know, from the highest administrative level right down to 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 the lowliest person taking out the cut off arms and legs. So. With, you know, libertarians are often uh, accused of being kind of uh, Vulcan, you know, in, uh, uh, or descended from Vulcans, not having many emotions and whatnot. How do you, and, you know, there's some truth to that, um, and, but how do you put the human back into that disruption? Because you're, I think, explaining extremely well where the kind of populism anger comes from. But it's not even necessarily government policy. I mean, it, it is in the case of saying, okay, put in a new computer system, but Amazon was started and Uber right, even yeah. more in, in yeah. the face of government restrictions. Yeah. Um, so how, how do we get back to the human? Because we also it's don't tough. want to deny, you know, the fact that Amazon is kind of a fucking great, uh, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we all use it, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're voting with our fingers. Uh, we're voting with our credit cards or whatever. You know, I mean, it's uh, uh, we're all in favor of it, obviously, even though it, it, it may be, uh, uh, you know, may, it cost us a job at one end, but got us a, a cheap couch at the other. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, push, uh, push me, pull you sort of situation. I think this is one of the reasons that this was a very tough election for libertarians, because it's hard for libertarians who are in favor of progress, who are in favor of innovation, and who are in favor of free enterprise, to when when these things, when, when disruption is caused by these fundamentally good things, net good things, uh, uh, but but when they're when they're uh, macro good things, I should say, but when they're causing disruption at a micro level, maybe we sometimes have to rethink a little bit um, um, our position of utter non interference other non-interference um, um, uh, in, 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 people, in people's lives. Um, you know, this is, to, it, it certainly would be a time to, um, uh, uh, for libertarians to get in there and work hard on getting rid of the kind of, uh, of, of, of regulations that put undue limits on any kind of Free enterprise, small businesses, the growth of small businesses. Small businesses shouldn't be penalized for growing. They shouldn't be zoned out of existence. You know, they shouldn't be regulated out of existence with regulations that, that, that really don't matter, uh, uh, have any, you know, uh, effect. Um, uh, you know, so it's time, time to do that. It's time to do a certain amount of, of explaining. And it may be, uh, uh, you know, maybe there are rational um, government interventions not to prevent any of these things from happening, but to ease the circumstances mm -hmm. under which they happen. So uh, I'm not be, enough. Of, I mean, that could be something ranging from a, a kind of better or a, a different type of social safety net than libertarians historically are comfortable with, or a universal basic income, or 
you know, we know the government. It yeah, really it could be something in that direction. People, but, you know? Yeah, to help people. Yeah, kind of I, I mean, I, I don't pretend to be enough of a policy wonk no. to say which of these things would be best or, or or not best. I leave that to the scholars at the Cato Institute and places <laughs> like that. But but I, but I have a feeling that that um, um, uh, you know that 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 comfort can be can be given and and mm-hmm. and, and and aid and assistance can be. Um, you know, so many kids are coming out of the educational system ill prepared for this modern economy. You know, I mean, right there with school vouchers, you've got a, you've got a good issue. Yeah. Do you? Um, I mean, are you optimistic? Uh, it, it, I mean, I think in the long run, uh, you know, I guess Keynes said famously, "In the long run, we're all dead." I think most yes. libertarians, I know, guy. <laughs> yeah, most libertarians I know, it's like in the long run, you know, it's the singularity. It just gets better and better, but. Over the next, you know, for your for your kids' adulthood, are you optimistic, or you know, is and is this a, um, you know, it's not that there's going to be one kind of, uh, you know, a, a rescission of a government regulation that allows everything to be good, and you know, and in addition of a new program that might make things better, but. You know, what has to happen? Is it mostly a change in attitude to understand that, it, you know, cliche as it is, that change is the only constant and that, you know, your kids are going to have to learn three or four different professions over the course of their life? And that's, You know, I think they're pretty hip to that, actually. Yeah. Um, I, and I don't think that they're particularly frightened by it. I think they're intrigued. Um, they, of course, have a capacity that I, at my age, mm-hmm. uh, don't, you know, to embrace embrace change enthusiastically. I mean, you know, it's like it, it, when you're a 13-year-old boy, like any change is good change. Hey, the house is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, everything's exciting. Uh, so uh, I am actually very optimistic. But, of course, I have had the good fortune, uh, and this had to do with, you know, making a decent income and also with, 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 with the person I married. Um, to, to, I had the good fortune to ensure that my kids had a good education or are getting a good education. And so they are going to be prepared both specifically with certain skills, but more important intellectually generally um, to, to cope with the change. And, you know, the change, the rate of change will slow down. I mean, there's, I already notice certain things with my kids, like they are fatigued with social media. They still use the hell out of it, but, they are beginning to be annoyed with it. And that, to me, is predictive. Um, my uh, eldest does a lot of online shopping, but she's very conservative with her money and very sort of strict about using her own money for her clothes purchases. And she and her friends have found all these apps where they basically pass clothes around. Mm-hmm. In which I don't think augurs well for the endless growth of the youth fashion industry. Yeah, well, this um, is the part of the problem, right? With uh, you know, it, I mean, I guess there's one model we can look to uh, as Europe, uh, which we might be 20 years behind or so in terms of social attitudes and the populist uprising and you know, nativism. But then there's Japan, which has fewer people now than it had at the turn of the century and is shrinking yeah. because it's an old. I don't think either of those are appropriate models for mm-hmm. us. I mean, Europe is so ingrained with its f- fractionalism and so over, I mean, and its proximity to all sorts of ugly customers. I mean, you know, it's, you can practically walk to war from anywhere in Europe, you know. And, uh, and Japan is so, such an isolated society, such an insular society, you know. I mean, we're, uh, for all the talk to the contrary, we're immigrant friendly. And we're an immigrant nation, and while we do have plenty of factions, they do all speak more or less the same language, right. more or less comprehensible to each other, you know, and are all, um, you know, are not um, uh, uh, divided up the, 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 the way that Europeans are, nor do we have this sort of royalist attitude that, that, that all good things rain down upon us from the government, which still obtains um, uh, in, 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 in these ex royal countries, even in France, you know, and uh, uh, where you think they would know better. But um, um, so I, yeah, I'm, I, I, I think things are, things are going to be fine, but, you know, there's going to be 
some, some trouble getting to the fine part. And um, libertarians, we, we, we may be fighting, um, um, we may be fighting some old battles. Uh, such I mean, as? we may be engaged. There may be there's an element of libertarianism that's still engaged in a in a war with. FDR. And uh, by that, you mean uh, that we are, uh, hopefully we're not going to be packing the Supreme Court, but uh, what, with entitlement spending, uh, things like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, this, these things have to be addressed. Right. They absolutely have to be addressed, and libertarians are in a very good position to, to, to address them. But when it comes to, like, certain sort of changes in the nature of the relationship of the individual to the state, uh, 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 many of us are, 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 and I include myself, you know, I mean, we're, we're still fighting the, um, uh, the fights that, that Milton Friedman, the fights that, the, the, the Hayek and so on fought. And I'm not saying that those fights don't still need to be fought, but I'm saying there are also other battles that we better get ourselves involved in. What, what is the first among those other battles? The first uh, at this moment is uh, is economic transition. Mm -hmm. How do we enable this economy to benefit most from the economic changes that are going to happen anyway? Right, and that's where you're talking about things like really getting past a lot of accreted regulations that, you know, it always, and I mean, in a way, I guess Trump, uh, Trump is speaking your language when he says for every regulation we pass, we're getting rid of two. Uh, that's a Yeah, not a bad idea. Yeah. And at the FDA. Not a bad idea. I mean, you know, the man is not with, 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 without some insights and, and, and I don't know if we'd go so far as to call them ideas, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, he perceives some things and he's, obviously he connects with, with people and stuff and he's, it's not like he's, wrong about everything you know but he uh he can be if he wants if he applies himself he can be wrong about everything. <laughs> he would seem to have a talent for it yeah uh, well let me ask you and uh, maybe we'll end on this do you is any part of you and your last big book was about uh about the baby boom generation uh, your generation yeah. and uh you know is there any part of you that misses the um exiting of uh, bill and hillary clinton from the stage of national and world politics not one iota. <laughs> Not one iota. It is goodbye and don't let the door hit you on the butt on the way out, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your hurry? Here's your hat. Yes. Here is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I hope, uh, you know, I hope that we, we can still remember that when the uh, nuclear Armageddon begins. Um, <laughs> or when Chelsea gets elected. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that will be uh, that'll be a time to I think rise to armed insurrection at that point rather than just uh, yeah, yeah 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 that's 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 when we talk to our friends in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will leave it there. We have been talking with P.J. O'Rourke. He's the author most recently of How the Hell Did This Happen. Uh, which chronicles the uh, the last year in American politics up through Donald Trump's uh, surprising victory. PJ, thanks so much for talking to us. It, it, it's very good to talk to you. I'm Nick Gillespie. This has been The Reason Podcast. Please subscribe to us at iTunes. And thanks for listening.